Uh, my name is Emma Stenstrom. I teach at the Business School, Stockholm School of Economics, and at the Arts, Design and Crafts School, Konstfack, which is a really fun thing in itself. How do you teach business both to art students and to business students? Are there differences? Are there similarities? And what happens if you actually make those two meet? I could talk for the rest of the afternoon about that. I will not. I will talk uh, uh, about something I hope, and I hope it's everything but unexpected. I talk fast, but I really hope you all fall asleep. <laughs> it's a bit dark, so it's easy. Because I hope you all know this so well, so it will be so familiar, so you will walk out of here and say, yeah, yeah, well, that was nothing new. I really hope that, honestly. I really hope to bring nothing new to you today. And why? Because I am sure that you are such an informed audience that you are not like many other audiences I have met. Not like all those, I can try actually. Uh, if I say entrepreneurship, what or who do you think of? Just a few. Someone who caters the message to the receiver. Ah, someone who caters the message to the receiver. Somebody else? Yeah. Why the peak? You see, you're so informed. Do we have anybody who's a little bit more naive? No. Great. You're going to fall asleep. Anyhow, when I ask that many, many times, and that didn't happen today, and I'm very happy about that, I tend to get names like oh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Ingvar Kamprad. Have you ever heard that? You get all those, mostly male, I must add, names, singular persons, like one person, the entrepreneur, as if that was entrepreneurship. We're going to bury the entrepreneur today. Put him in a grave. Do you agree with me? in that sense that I think it's time to perhaps not give up, but at least modify, nuance that kind of image of the entrepreneur. Isn't it? The entrepreneur. As a one and only person doing things for him or perhaps herself. Entrepreneurship is, in my opinion, always, always a social activity, can never be anything else. You might be one person starting up a company, but you will always work with others, always, always collaborate, always work with customers, can never be anything but a social activity. And we're going to get on a little bit and look at what it actually looks like. It's a little bit the same as with leadership. I usually teach leadership at both the business school and the art school. Leadership is the same thing. You talk about leadership and you get all these leaders, these persons, usually male there too. One person. This person is so important. This is the leader. As we saw in the movie in the beginning today, no, of course, it can never be. Leadership is nothing without followers. Leadership is nothing but a social activity. And if you look at leadership research, this is really changing now. This is just one picture of it. It's from a textbook on leadership where a, a British author is really talking about the different discourses of leadership. And in, in, I would say in research, forget that one person kind of hero, romantic notion. We're talking processes, we're talking followership, we're talking dispersed leadership, we're talking networks, we're talking collaboration. Not that one person any longer. Forget the Messiah that might have been popular from the 80s and on. Forget that kind of, remember that old guy sitting behind the desk making decisions kind of without any interaction. Also forget a little bit about the coach and therapist as the one person. You might call him or her, or leadership as a process, eco-leadership. We discussed that. 
but at least remember that kind of collaborative turn on leadership, because that is happening in research. Not always, though, in the media, and not always in practice. I just spoke to somebody who, who was offered a management position the other day, and who said, what about if we split it on two? Was that accepted? Of course not. You still, we still tend to think of the one person. Moving on to entrepreneurship. What about this? Team entrepreneurship. This is why you should not be alone, because now I have to check my own time and give myself notice about the time that's left. Um, team entrepreneurship. That is a little bit like the same thing as with leadership. It's actually, I would say, we do see a bit of a collaborative turn here again. Now, remember, I'm an academic. I love theories. I love research. A uh, little bit of like the collaborative turn is showing here too, I would say. Bringing up things like team entrepreneurship. Wait a minute. Not only that kind of social activity, but actually looking at companies, startups. And yes. Most companies are still started by one single person, if you count all different kinds. But actually, a lot of them are started by teams, and many, many more than perhaps we've been thinking about. Now, a lot of you are students. I don't know, how do you feel? I feel like my students usually, I don't know if I have any of my students here, but usually seem to think more in this collaborative mood. Like we heard from you guys, you are not alone. And from several others, how, it's really, what about if we do it as a team? It's about if you look at um, companies in Sweden who are not in Schilda Företag, it's about half-half started by teams and about and solo entrepreneurs. So it's quite common with the team. And bringing that up is of course important. Another thing, this is a doctoral dissertation that came last year here in Sweden. Karin Hellerstedt about team entrepreneurship, uh, she, which is a really good reading, and she also summarizes a lot of research. Uh, what she says is that businesses, startups, do not start with the business idea. That's another myth. They do not start with a business idea. When it comes to this team entrepreneurship, they start with the relationship. Do you agree? Disagree? Yes. Agree? Yes. Start with a relationship. Of course, it's not like everybody, but that is a very common way. You start with a relationship. The Romeo and Juliet. Actually, a lot of companies start by married couples. That's also a little bit away from that image, isn't it? Married couples. Very, very common but teams and relationships, and that comes before the business idea. Something to think about, I think. Why? Because trust is the most important issue. Trust. That means knowing the people you're working with. Personally, I find this great. I find it great because I can, it happens at least, that I meet students, my focus is usually on students. I meet students who feel like, I ask them, do you want to become an entrepreneur? And they know, uh, yeah, but yeah, it's a bit scary, and I don't know, and I, I, I'm not sure I could do this. Picture it more as the relationship part. Picture it more as building relationships. Take the time in school or wherever you are. Build relationships, work with fun people. It makes it easier. So therefore, I think it's important to kind of bury the entrepreneur and change the image. What about diversity when you talk about it? I don't know about you guys, how are you diverse? No? 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 Yeah, I mean, in knowledge, to some extent, but not. In knowledge? Yeah, not but you're similar in values and yeah, yeah. looks? <laughs> 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 Education, gender, yeah. some, yeah. But you have some di differences in knowledge. Yeah, because diversity is something you could actually, I think, uh, interpret in many different ways. What about diver diversity when it comes to teams here, when you talk about team entrepreneurship? We're talking about creative collaborations here. Well, usually it's said that a, a more diverse team leads to higher creativity 
more innovation. You heard, all heard that. I'm sure some of you have seen the models showing that, for example, if you align different disciplines, you will get, it's more risky, it's easier to fail, it's more risky, don't forget that. But actually, if you succeed, you might get more innovative products from having different disciplines working together. Um, and yes, most research seems to point in this direction. More diversity leads to more creativity. However, less diversity might lead to more efficiency. But as we know from Terence, forget efficiency. Not forget, perhaps. But you can, I mean, think about that. And can you do something? Can you balance? What about this? How, how does it look? You were different in knowledge. This company? Creativity versus efficiency? Or, what's this? Creativity versus efficiency. Do you know who these guys are? Actually, a bunch of architects. Swedish architects. Some of the more, probably, famous ones. They also look pretty much the same, huh? Does that mean necessarily that they are not diverse? I'm not going to say that. Of course not. There are, as you were saying, there are different ways to be different. I happen to know some of those architects, and I can say that they do have the same background, they do look the same, but they are quite different too. So there are different ways, of course. You can have different values. You can have different disciplines, different sexes, whatever, different nationalities, backgrounds. The important thing is really, what happens if you have diversity? Well, you do get into cognitive conflicts, research says. You have, because you have different mindsets. How do you interpret something? And that in, in itself might lead to innovation. While you're more similar, you might have more emotional conflicts. But not the cognitive ones, because you're more similar mindsets. I think having like different genders, as I said before, bury the entrepreneur, bury the picture of the only main entrepreneur is also because we do have different experiences, mostly, as if we are women and men. So yes, bring in more diverse teams, I think. But, of course, you do need to balance. You do need to balance the Excel sheets with the post-it notes. Am I the only one thinking about that? I mean, everybody kind of make fun of us as business people always using Excel sheets. But honestly, Anybody visited the design school? A lot of post-it notes, I tell you. It's about, can you mix this? Can you mix the Excel sheets and the post-it notes? Or the PowerPoints and the post-its? Can you mix efficiency and creativity? Finding the new business models, that for me is actually finding this kind of balance between those two, efficiency and creativity. And that you do with at least some kind of a diversity, I think. I think I kept the time. So, yes, I did. So we have a little bit of time for questions for our panel, or please come back up. All right. Thanks. <laughs> We're gonna have to share this microphone now. Yeah, that's okay. They, yeah, you look quite nice with this kind of... <laughs> you look like you're standing in the woods now. Right. <laughs> what about the audience? Yes, we have one up there. Uh, I have a question to the board from Tesla guys. Yeah. How much money did you put into the project and how much money did you put uh, Please repeat the question. Uh, how much money did we put into the project? And how much money did we get? get? Uh, well, we, we started. I mean, we were doing the prototype before there was even uh, money involved, since we already had computers. Um, and basically, that's the, the cool thing with uh, doing an internet business. Um, in the end, we put in the money we needed to, uh, to make uh, ActiveLog. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, the, um, the, what is that? Corporation. <laughs> uh, co corporation. Um, and uh, based on that, we actually uh, managed to, um, to negotiate the deal with uh, Svensk Nysleiv before we started uh, having any costs or, um, uh, or quitting our jobs. So actually when we quitted our jobs we knew that we were going to be uh, paid for uh, at least the coming year and uh, in the end we have uh, financed to have four people full-time employed for uh, our two first years 
and uh, then we have a slighter less amount to uh, to cope on on the last last year so uh, you do the math with how much money that is <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think I think it was a, it was a good it was a good point. I mean, I think that they uh, uh, one thing I didn't mention that one of the thing one of the fifth slides that I had to cut had to do with uh, that the many things impact your business model, and your business model is not fixed, and your business model means change, and just as the just as the idea oftentimes changes, and so while their idea stayed relatively the same, the business model that they initially had had to be adjusted based upon these conditions. So I think that, the, that uh, uh, that's the comment that I would have with respect to that. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about going abroad with your business idea? With Onward? Yeah. Uh, okay, so it, we have ta thought about going abroad with Onward. Um, we have thought about it. Uh, it's. Um, there exists a, a couple of services that, that does the same thing, or almost the same thing, in other countries, for example, uh, the UK, uh, and uh, our neighboring uh, countries, Denmark and uh, Norway, does something that's a, a bit of the same, uh, at least. So uh, th the problem with it is that it's a totally new, uh, new um, government to work with to get the data and... You should, uh, you should form partnerships with yeah, yeah, yeah. people in uh, the country. It's like, for example, I'm living in Italy. It's even hard to find the number two in your doctor, so... It's, ha it's hard here as well, I think. <laughs> well, good yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, in terms of uh, field guys, on board, on cassette, do you ever think about, um, rather than only going to San Stan also going to the big players, meaning pharmaceutical companies and I know the private hospitals and stuff like that, or would that buy you too much in one way or another? Uh, we were thinking about uh, talking to other to other players. Uh, when it comes to big private hospitals and stuff, that would not be a good idea because we want to be uh, unbiased and, of course, uh, present the information as it is uh, already. There is, um, I wouldn't say a discussion, but there are question marks since we are funded by the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. What is actually their intention with this whole project? And aren't they, aren't they advocating uh, uh, healthcare solutions based on uh, on insurance, private insurances, and such, which they are not? Uh, but for us, it was important to to stay out of that field as much as we could. Uh, when it comes to the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, there was a slight interest, but it wasn't enough to say this is going to be good for the public in general. Um, I guess they, they wanted something more um, hands-on for them to get in, involved in the parties. Um, how you, could you tell us a bit more about how you, the agreement you have with your sponsor? I mean, so they fund you, but do they cover all your costs? Or do they, do they give you all the money you need? Uh, it started out as a sort of a study. I mean, they showed interest, and we came up with a like a like a report, short report on or or a business model. I don't no, not really more like a short report about how we would take this project and make it real. Uh, and based on that, we made a, we made a budget, and there was, I mean, there's a le legal agreement in the in the bottom, but we own the site, so they finance us to be the catalyst, the driver of social change. That's the that's the short version of it. So, uh, I have a, a connected question uh, first to Terence and then from the US government uh, audience. What happens when one of the key partnerships that you need to make uh, is actually not so keen on making that partnership? For example, when you take the Spotify business, the, comp uh, the music record label were not interested initially in this, this business model, which Spotify has existed for at least 10 years before that on the internet. But these companies were really not so warm to doing it. How do you smoothen out this situation? And then 
explain to you guys how did you how do you do that with the organizations you are dealing with Sweden who are who do not necessarily want to give away the information for whatever interest. Okay. Uh, first of all, the Spotify business model might very well be a transitional business model. It's unclear how stable it is. And we heard recently when uh, uh, Time Warner uh, gave uh, notice that they might be uh, pulling out uh, and what happened there. I think that the, the reason that Spotify was able to do it was because uh, people believed they couldn't make a go of it. So I think they were able to cut the deals with the uh, record labels because they said, hey, no one else has been able to do it. If we can make some money out of, out of our catalog, is better than nothing. So they sign these agreements, and then all of a sudden they see Spotify out there actually doing it. And so now all of those contracts are under review. And I have no idea how tight those contracts are, and I'm sure that they have lawyers working day and night trying to figure out how to potentially get out of them, if they, saying if they can do it, we can do it. So it very well might be that this is a transitional uh, model. The question again, sorry, I was... <laughs> Well, I think it was quite easy for us. We, we tried a little bit with the counties. They said, we're not interested. We know we should do this, and we will do this, but you just wait. And we were not happy with the answer, so we went to uh, another organization. Uh, I had to admit, we thought it was sort of a long shot to try with the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, but turns out that uh, they are interested in having an efficient healthcare system in Sweden, because with that, we need less taxes to pay for the healthcare. Um, businesses will be taxed um, with less money, we will have people who are on sick leave coming back to their jobs faster, which will be good for the Swedish enterprises and so on, uh, which makes perfect uh, sense, but we just um, didn't see that connection that strong. And uh, I still think it would be a better case actually to work with the counties, they, they, it's their, um, their duty to, to provide this information, this service to the people or the, the Swedish state. But it didn't happen, and, and we had to move on because we had our idea, and in the end, it worked out. Sorry, now I have to move on as well. Uh, please. I have a question. I'm from Karolinska, and I had some experience in this field of health economics. Uh, my question is, uh, did you try to approach this problem from uh, another perspective? That's, that is, the patients are going to different hospitals, uh, then they are going to different departments, and then they are going to different doctors within the same department. And if you have noticed, in USA, there, there are websites uh, with hospitals, doctors, and everything, and I think the government doesn't have problem uh, sharing this uh, data on the website. So when a patient has uh, attended a doctor, they can rate the performance of that doctor so it is a benchmark for other patients. And like this, the, <coughs> the website will grow up automatically. And you will have all the research data without depending on socialist religion. Uh, yeah, we have been, uh, we, we're actually strong advocates of user, uh, user interaction. And we, we would like to release uh, features that, that are more um, uh, more for the users to be able to do what, what you're talking about, sort of um, reviewing or their 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 care, their hospital or their primary care center. Um, but uh, those sites that you're talking about, there exist some in the U.S. and there's one in Sweden as well, where you can actually rate your doctor. Um, uh, I don't think they're, they've been accepted yet uh, as as good information sources, so uh, I think there's some, some, someone in the future will make them. Uh, I know that in England uh, they have uh, um, actual data on individual doctors that do heart uh, transplants, for example, like how how they, how often they succeed and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, public, and that's going to take a while in Sweden. <laughs> uh, did some, did, didn't someone advertise these websites well, like in the? the or something. 
were, is, was it because it didn't succeed in Sweden because these consumer websites were not uh, advertised well in the media? Possibly. I, I just want to say, keep in mind that the, the U.S. healthcare system primarily is private. Uh, and that, uh, that yeah. context changes, uh, changes everything. Yeah, and just to put a point on your question is that you possibly can force a potential partner to become your partner, but that's probably not the best relationship to have. <laughs> Good comment. Yeah, let's have a very last before we break for lunch. I'm really sorry, but you can stay and ask questions perhaps over lunch. Uh, what would you send with this crowd from what you said? Is there any very short advice you would give, Terence? The like it's coming up. Yeah, the title. Uh, business models, that's where the money is at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a good one. And uh, just uh, try again if you if it doesn't work the first time with the model. I mean, there's bound to be another one that works. That's a good one. Well, if you can't uh, get the, 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 the user or the consumer to pay, think who has interest in, in actually making these things happen. That's what happened to us. And I just want to send with you, as you know, uh, don't think of yourself as lonely. Make friends, create relationships, and you can do that over lunch. Because now it's time for lunch. Thanks for coming.